Good morning. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. I'm Ernie Armstrong, and it's my privilege to lead in Bible study this morning from Colonial Hill. We are continuing our very interesting study of the very interesting book of Job. Uh, today, our lesson is taken from the 19th chapter, um, and it contains a good deal of material, and in my opinion, uh, the verses study, under study for our lesson, verses 19 through 29, um, are more difficult or somewhat confusing if we don't get the context and some reference to the entire uh, portion of chapter 19. Uh, which then makes it a little bit more time-consuming, and so let me jump right in. As we studied a couple of weeks ago, the context for uh, any passage out of the book of Job uh, needs to begin in chapter 1, which establishes that Job has excellent character, even acknowledged by God, chapter 1, verse 8. But God permits Satan to test Job by taking away his wealth, his family, and finally his health. And so chapters, uh, we find the, the health part, of, especially in uh, chapter 2. From chapter 2 through, uh, really through almost the end of the book, uh, we are seeing conversations between Job and his friends. Uh, there is, uh, in chapter 5, God speaks, but uh, uh, let, let's, let's look at the pattern anyway throughout all of these chapters, is that Job's friends are convinced that God prospers the innocent and punishes the guilty. Therefore, they try to convince Job that he must be guilty of some terrible sin to receive all of the, or to be the recipient of all of the uh, tragedies that befall him. And since he must be guilty of sin, he needs to repent. Job, on the other hand, refuses to acknowledge that sin is the cause of his problem because he believes he is innocent. Um, which we, from the beginning of our study of Job, we know that to be true. He is, in fact, innocent of any sin that would bring about this type of punishment. So here we are in chapter 19. The immediate context of chapter 19 is... Uh, uh, Job's essentially Job's reply to one of his friends, uh, who uh, uh, and that friend's name is Bildad. Uh, he had Bildad in chapter eighteen has been rebuking Job fairly harshly, uh, and warns him that the wicked will be punished, uh, including describing the kinds of punishment that the wicked. Uh, can and should expect. And certainly the implication is that Job is among those who are wicked and uh, even deserves the punishment that he is receiving. He must because that's what God does. He punishes the wicked is their thinking. So chapter 19 is Job's reply to Bildad's last uh, attack upon him. Um, so let's, let's look uh, to see how Job begins his rebuttal to Bildab's speech. Um, and he is going to take, Job is going to take issue with the mistreatment that he's experiencing. Not only from Bildab, but also uh, from his other three friends. And he does that in the first six verses. I'm going to run through those first six verses. Then Job replied, 
How long will you torment me and crush me with words? He's talking to his friends now. Ten times now you have reproached me. Shamelessly you attack me. If it is true that I have gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. If indeed you would exalt yourselves above me and use my humiliation against me, then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Uh, There have been speeches from Job's friends, uh, Eliphaz, Bildab, and Zophar. Eliphaz and Bildab have two discourses, if you will, or speeches uh, to you that were used or brought against uh, Job. Um, and he says in verse 2, ten times you have reproached me. There are five speeches, and maybe Job is saying this is sort of a double attack, and that's how he gets ten. I'm not real sure where that number comes from. But the point is that Job is getting really tired of his friends, these men, his friends, and their accusatory and inflammatory speeches against him. And so he says, in essence, my sin is none of your business. It's my concern alone. But God is still treating me wrong, Job says. He continues in the realm of what is, uh, in verses 5 and 6, which I read, uh, suggesting that the potential exists that God is punishing some sort of sin that's unknown to him, but is well known to God. But Job is telling his friends, is trying to tell his friends, that even if they, his friends, should uh, or could somehow find what his sin is and prove that Job has committing it, committed it, which Job is saying, you can't because I haven't, Job still feels that God is treating him unjustly. Uh, And so Job asserts just that. Uh, Look at verses 7 through 13. And again, we're going to quickly run through this to try to get the uh, the, the context for really some of the most amazing faith-filled verses in the Bible. Though I cry, I've been wronged, I get no response. This is Job talking again in verse 7. Though I call for help, there is no justice. He has blocked me, so I cannot pass. The he that Job is referring to is God. Uh, He's starting to tell his friends what God has done to him. Uh, so all of these statements through verse 13 is Job's proof that God is treating him wrongly, violently, even unjustly. So we go on. He has blocked my way so I cannot pass. He has, a, he has shrouded my paths in darkness. He has stripped me of honor and removed the crown from my head. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. His troops advance in force. They build a siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has alienated my brothers from me. My acquaintances are completely estranged. My friends have forgotten me. My, uh, I've gotten ahead. Uh, let's pause there. We can see a progression in Job's thoughts here. He spends most of these verses speaking of what he believes or perceives that God is doing to him in a wrong way. Um, then at the end of this section, in verse 13, he still has his focus on what God is doing to him, and yet... Job is now starting to shift his focus, at least a bit, to what other people are doing to wrong him. Uh, It's still all under God's control, and so God still gets the blame. 
But under God's sovereignty, Job is now going to start complaining about how men are wronging him. Let's pause for just a moment as we are studying these these verses to point out Job's complaints about his friends And their accusations against him in his suffering, their accusations are boiled down. You are suffering, therefore, and God punishes those who do wrong. Therefore, you're suffering because God is punishing you for doing wrong. Therefore, you did something wrong. You are guilty of sin and you're getting tremendous punishment. He lost his family, he lost his wealth, lost his health. Tremendous punishment. Therefore, you must have been guilty of tremendous sin. Instead of being the friends that anyone who is experiencing suffering needs to have, instead of having friends accusing of wrongdoing, Job, like all of the rest of us who are suffering, need friends who may be nothing, who may be doing nothing more than just being there for us or with us encouraging us, reminding us how much God loves us instead of accusing us of terrible wrongs uh, and that God is justly uh, punishing us. So let's look at how Job is talking about how others wrong him. Uh, Look at verses 14 through 19, which is actually our starting verse for today's lesson. My kinsmen have gone away. My friends have forgotten me. My guests and my maidservants count me a stranger. Some say foreigner. They look upon me as an alien. I summon my servant, but he does not answer, though I beg him with my own mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own brothers. Even the little boys scorn me when I appear. They ridicule me. All, and here's our first verse of today's lesson, all my intimate friends detest me. Those I have, I love, have turned against me. Uh, One of the commentaries that I tried to study this lesson from uh, says, You can be alone even when you're not by yourself. Job is feeling totally alone. You name it. Whatever the relationship that exists in Job's life, he says, and rightly so apparently, they have all treated him poorly. Whether it's his kinfolks, his friends, uh, his uh, house the people who work in his house, even his own wife, young children, close friends. He says his intimate friends, those who know him and share his innermost thoughts and being, all of them have turned away from him. So Job is totally alone. He is, in his mind, forsaken by man and by God. Uh, plus he has great physical, his health, physical difficulties to deal with. Verse 20, uh, I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped with only the skin of my teeth. Um, That, of course, is an idiom, and it actually says, all I have are the gums in in my mouth. Uh, But it has become, it is translated by the skin of my teeth. Of course, there is no skin on our teeth. And yet, this expression has become an idiom to mean I just barely escaped, just barely got by, uh, by the skin of my teeth. It comes from Job. Um, So where is Job going with all of this? He has listed all of his troubles, and he he is not really he certainly is complaining, but not just to complain, but instead he is appealing for some mercy from his what he thought were friends of his. 
and they have been showing no mercy. Look at verses 21 and 22. Have pity. I see him folding his hands. Have pity on me, my friends. Have pity, for the, God, the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? So if God's apparent persecution of Job isn't enough, these so-called friends have added to his troubles. Uh, and now Job begins to turn, and we are about to see some of the greatest statements of faith, certainly in the Old Testament, maybe in the entire, in the entire uh, Bible. Job has appealed to his friends for pity, but it's apparent he's not going to get any pity or mercy from them. They're going to be just as harsh on him. His friends are going to be just as harsh on him as others are, and frankly, even as he has perceived God to be. And so, since no one is listening to Job's cries for mercy, that leads him to wish aloud for an ability to have his words recorded forever, <clears throat> apparently in hopes that someday someone will come along and in the future see what he is saying and they might be able to sympathize with him. They might be able to look and see that he is innocent and is not guilty of all of these terrible things that uh, his friends have been uh, hurling at him. Uh, he says in verses 23 and 24, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. Now, there's a little bit of difficulty in the translations, I understand, because I've looked at several different translations. And it may be that he's talking about engraving his words on stone in addition to writing them on a scroll. Writing them on a scroll will preserve his thoughts his complaints about being mistreated, his insistence that he is actually innocent. If he writes them on a scroll in a book, they might be remembered or uh, be able to be examined for some period of time. But if he is able to en actually engrave them on stone, I think of the Ten Commandments, God engraving the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, they will... Uh, remain and exist, he hopes, forever. Again, the idea is that someone will come along and see his protestations of innocence and sympathize with him and have sympathy. Uh, interestingly, he got his wish. His words are recorded in a book. We call it the book of Job. And they have been preserved for ever from his time until now. Um, Job is from the land of Uz, U-Z. I don't know if that's Uz or Uz. Uh, which predates the establishment of Israel. Uh, he is not under the Jewish law. Uh, he is somewhere probably between Abraham and Moses in time. Um, so he doesn't have, he is not an Israelite, uh, but he worships and has been faithful to the one true God, which we see back in chapter one. We, are, we should always remember that even God says he is uh, a man of excellent character. Yet when it comes down to it, even though we are now reading 
the book of Job, we're not the audience that Job is wanting at this time. Uh, and we're also not the audience that he, at that time, actually needs. Uh, so how do we know the truth of what I just said? Well, in the next few verses, verses 25 through 27 in particular, Job identifies the audience, the ultimate audience that he's really looking for to hear him. It's one that he identifies as my Redeemer, who is none other than God himself. And I, that's the position I take. There are differences of opinion as to who the Redeemer is that Job is calling out to. Uh, we're going to uh, look at that in just a moment, and we'll see a little bit of some other of, of some of the possibilities of who Job is talking about. But let's look at the verses, uh, and, and then try to get some full understanding. Job says in verse 25, in verses 25 through 27 are the verses that I'm talking about that many say are the greatest examples of faith expressed in the entire Bible, um, partly because it predates the establishment of Israel and the written word of Israel, which we call the Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, it predates certainly the New Testament and our concept of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Christ is Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah, our, our Redeemer, our Savior. Let's look uh, at these verses. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Um, wow. Let's, uh, let's examine these words. Verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives. Um, I'm not a musical person, but I am familiar with Handel's Messiah. And uh, this ought to remind us of uh, one of the uh, songs from, uh, from that work of musical art. I know my Redeemer liveth or lives. So who is my Redeemer? The, re the word here, I've seen it uh, as a Hebrew word in the, in the material I've read, uh, pronounced, uh, not pronounced, spelled G-A-A-L or G-A-E-L. Uh, it means uh, Redeemer. Uh, it's an Old Testament um, concept. Remember, uh, in all likelihood, Job predates the Old Testament. Um, the Hebrew word means to redeem or to act as a kinsman redeemer. Uh, redemption, in the sense of the redeemer, has to do with release from legal obligation or deliverance from desperate circumstances. Closely associated with a payment necessary to effect to accomplish that release. Um, Jewish law made provision for the Israelites to redeem family members in dire straits. Um, look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 25. If your brother becomes poor and sells some of his possessions, then his kinsman who is next to him shall come, and that's the same word, and redeem that which his brother has sold. Uh, there, there are other examples. Now, we don't have time to go read it, but there are other examples in the Old Testament of a kinsman redeemer, sometimes redeeming out, uh, a fellow family member out of poverty, but also sometimes writing a, writing a wrong that has been committed. 
um, it's quite possible that as the patriarch of the family, Job himself has redeemed others, either by buying them out of or paying their debts and getting them out of poverty, or maybe even literally buying them out of slavery. Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. But he doesn't tell us who his Redeemer is or what his Redeemer will redeem him uh, from, uh, nor when his Redeemer will redeem him. So does Job believe that God will redeem him? Or is he, a, is he counting on some family member? Well, most of his family members have been killed in the tragedy. There are some who suggest that Job has been inspired, and who by anyone else but God, to be looking forward to Christ, the Messiah, as his Redeemer. And yet, that idea has not been introduced uh, at the time of Job. So he is ahead of everyone. Uh, another question is, will uh, his Redeemer redeem him during his lifetime or after his death? Um, if it is after his death, will he be resurrected so that he might witness his vindication, being found either not guilty or innocent? Uh, we don't have the answer to these questions, not specifically, but many believe that this is a forward-looking, a forward-looking towards Christ the Redeemer, Christ the Messiah, our Savior. Um, so Job, in the middle of his trials, is expressing a great sentiment, a great statement of faith. Um, he doesn't just recognize who God is to him, his Redeemer. He declares that God will stand on the earth. Um, he says... Uh, In verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. Many New Testament scholars believe Job is referencing the Messiah and his return, his second coming, when he will stand on the earth in judgment. Others think, no, he is talking about his Redeemer, who at the end, at the end of the prosecution, the case against him in court in front of, of God as the judge, his Redeemer will stand there in the end with him, and he will prevail. I like the other idea that he is talking about a Redeemer who will eventually uh, stand on this earth in judgment of all, and he will be vindicated. And he talks, and th those who believe that interpretation uh, also believe that he, Job, is talking about a resurrection. Even before the Jewish, uh, the concept of resurrection has been introduced to the Jewish people, uh, he is raising that point here. He says, And after my skin has been destroyed, that is, after I die, yet in my, in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. He says, There will be a resurrection. There will be life after death. And although my physical earthly life is going to be destroyed, and I'm about to die, which we see later is not what happens. I know I will nevertheless have a face-to-face -face encounter with my God, and I will be able to present my case and plead my case to him. 
I believe that's a position that most of us who have suffered or experienced a great loss look forward to ourselves, a time to stand before God and ask him questions. Now, I also think we will know the answers before we ever stand before God. And I think the rest of the book of Job, we will find some of those answers. But Job finishes verse 27 by saying, how my heart yearns within me. I think he is saying, I am looking forward to that day and I have faith and confidence that I have a Savior. God himself, I don't know that he knows, I don't think he knows Jesus as Messiah. It's not even a concept that's been introduced to the Jews yet. But I yearn for the time I will have that opportunity with my Redeemer to stand before God. And then he turns back, and we got we must finish with these two verses. He turns back to his friends and said, and an interesting uh, conclusion of uh, his position with them. He says, "If you say, how will we hound him, since the root of the trouble lies in him?" You should fear the sword yourselves, for wrath will bring punishment by the sword, and then you will know that there is judgment. He, Job is not really, I don't think he is threatening his friends. He's certainly not threatening to brandish the sword against them himself. But he is saying, someone is going to vindicate me and you will be subject to judgment yourselves. In essence, you are committing a sin against me uh, by all of your false accusations, and you're going to be judged for it. And the truth will be known. And the truth is, I'm innocent. There is so much more, and so much more that we will get to in our study of Job. Uh, we can't finish it all today. Um, and so let me invite you to come back and study Job with us. As we, towards the end of the study of Job, we will see how God responds to Job. And Job will understand more. And maybe you and I, through such study, can understand more ourselves. Thank you for joining with us in this interesting study. I wish you a wonderful Sabbath day and a great week to come. Thank you. Good morning.